Hello, IB Biology students. This is Ms. Sheely with um, your section 1.1 Introduction to Cells Notes. All right, so first thing to remember is that the cell theory has three basic principles. One principle is that all living things are made out of cells. Even multicellular organisms have specialized cells to carry out various functions. But something to think about, are unicellular organisms made of cells? Or are they cells? So this is an oddly worded um, statement, but we are stating that all living things are made up of cells or a cell. Cells are the smallest units of life. We know that organelles carry out various metabolic functions within the cell, but these components cannot survive alone. So your nucleus, for example, can't survive without the cell in its entirety. So cells all this are the smallest units of life. They are, however, not the smallest units of matter. Um, something else is that Cells refuted the idea of spontaneous generation with his experiments, and we will get into those um, a little bit later on in this unit, um, but that is something to know, and that we do know that cells multiply by division. We will talk about mitosis and meiosis in eukaryotic cells, and then there's the process of binary fission in prokaryotic cells. And all cells have descended from simpler common ancestors. So this idea of common ancestry is um, really important in the idea of cells come from other cells. Cell theory is a great example of a scientific process. So here we have an observation, and our first observation is Hooks observed cork cells. That observation, along with um, Van Leeuwenhoek's bacteria drawings, were our first uh, observation, which led to a hypothesis. The hypothesis was tested, and then um, in the scientific process, it's either refuted, such as with our idea of vitalism. No, we may see these things, but we need a vital energy source is the source of life, or cytoplasts build cells, or life generates spontaneously. And if we hit this refute area, we'll just go back to our hypothesis, and we'll try another hypothesis. Maybe um, cells come from other cells, or life does generate spontaneously, and then we'll test it. And with the test, we come up with the idea of the evidence. So we have microscopic or observations, such as light microscopes, or then now in the modern days, we have um, transition electron mic transmission electron microscopes or scanning electron microscopes. We can culture organisms. We can look at previous experiments, such as Louis Pasteur's or Remax's um, discovery of cell division. And if we don't get this refuted, we can corroborate um, our hypothesis and living things are made of cells or cells are the smallest units of life or cells come only from other cells. And then even if we get to this corroborate area, we're going to keep repeating and repeating and repeating and then maybe um, it will become a theory. So it's not that a hypothesis can turn into a theory, but our idea from our observation can become a theory if we get enough information. All right, so um, a piece of evidence for this cell theory, all living things are made of cells. We have two um, scientists who were around about the same time um, that really led to this idea of all living things are made of cells. So we have Robert Hooke, who was a pioneering microscopic microscopist, excuse me. He was an optics enthusiast, and he was the coiner of the term cell following his drawings of cork sections under a microscope. And here are uh, is a here is, excuse me, an image of um, Hook's drawing of, excuse me, the cork cells. And then we have an Antonine van Leeuwenhoek, and he is coined the father of microbiology. He was a master lens maker, and he used the lens to analyze the quality of the cloth in his factory. He discovered these things that he named animacules in water, and he wrote his findings to the Royal Society, and he eventually became known as the discoverer of cells. So Leeuwenhoek is the discoverer of cells, but Robert Hooke is the namer of cells. So we can see here um, drawings by um, Van Leeuwenhoek and a picture of Lovely Hook and Van Leeuwenhoek. Hello, and 
and welcome to Microbiology Bites. In this video, Anthony von Leeuwenhoek. Around the year 1590, two Dutch spectacle makers, Hans and Zacharias Janssen, were experimenting with glass lenses. They put several lenses in a tube and discovered that an object near the end of the tube could be viewed at much greater magnification than a simple magnifying glass could achieve. This was the invention of the microscope. In 1648, while working for a cloth merchant in Amsterdam, Antony van Leeuwenhoek saw his first simple microscope, which was only capable of magnifying a few times, but was useful for counting the threads in cloth. He acquired a microscope for his own use, and became so interested that he went on to learn how to make his own lenses. During his lifetime, Van Leeuwenhoek ground more than 500 optical lenses and created over 400 microscopes, only nine of which still exist today. His microscopes consisted of silver or copper frames rather than a tube to hold the lenses. By grinding and polishing, he was able to make lenses with large curvatures. These fat lenses produced greater magnifications and his microscopes were eventually able to magnify up to 270 times but Van Leeuwenhoek never published his method of how to make these superb lenses. The English scientist Robert Hooke also spent much of his life working with microscopes and improving their design. In 1664, Hooke published a book entitled Micrographia, in which he described and illustrated small insects such as fleas, but which also contained the first description of plant cells. It's believed that Van Leeuwenhoek read Hooke's book in 1665 and that this stimulated him to use his microscopes for the purpose of investigating the natural world. In 1674, Van Leeuwenhoek discovered protists, which he called animalcules, from the Latin for little animal, in lake water. And in 1676, he was the first person to observe bacteria scraped from the film between his own teeth. In 1677, he also became the first person to observe spermatozoa. But Van Leeuwenhoek's work went far beyond merely observing microorganisms. For example, in 1676, he described his methods of making infusion cultures of microorganisms. So the next time anyone tries to tell you that Louis Pasteur was the father of microbiology, remind them that Van Leeuwenhoek got there 200 years earlier. Van Leeuwenhoek began to send his microscopic observations to the Royal Society in England, and in 1676 he sent his first observations of microscopic single-celled organisms. But such was the quality of his microscopes that other scientists were initially unable to repeat his observations, and his credibility was questioned. Eventually, in 1680, Van Leeuwenhoek's work was accepted by the Royal Society. Van Leeuwenhoek has rightly become known as the father of microbiology, and the Federation of European Microbiology Societies, FEMS, has its headquarters in the Dutch town of Delft, the birthplace of the science of microbiology. All right, what a great little video. All right, cells vary in shape but share several common features. One feature is that every living cell is surrounded by a cell membrane, which separates the cell from the um, contents of the outside world. And here is just a cell membrane. The second thing is that cells contain genetic material, which stores all the instructions for the cell's activity. That genetic material can be DNA or RNA. Here we have a DNA um, image. And then the last thing is that most cellular activities are chemical reactions which are catalyzed by enzymes that are produced within the cell and our enzymes are here that we just covered in our last unit. And then finally we have that cells have their own energy release system that powers all of a cell's activities and we have both the chloroplast and the mitochondria that we'll get into um, in more detail with their function excuse me, in the next section of this unit. All right, there are limitations and exceptions to the cell theory. We have an amoeba, um, which is a type of protist. Um, the amoeba is a single cell capable of all life processes. So if it is only one cell, can we say that it's made of cells, plural? 
The other exceptions and limitations, we have fungi hyphae. Um, fungal hyphae are very large. They are multi-nucleated, which means that they have many nuclei. And their um, cell wall is made of chitin, not cellulose. And they have a continuous cytoplasm. Um, if you are going on into the HL um, level, HLB, you will learn more about fungal hyphae in plant science. Another exception is we have muscle cells. So muscle cells are also multinucleated and they're also very long, which is um, different or an exception to our cell theory. And then of course our viruses. Are they living? Are they not living? Are they a cell? Are they not a cell? Um, many consider them to not be living or not be a cell because they cannot reproduce on their own. They can only reproduce when um, they are in control of a host cell. But there is some debate on if they are their own living or if they are, are a cell themselves. All right, all living organisms carry out the functions of life. So here you have the functions of life. You have um, nutrition, growth, reproduction, response to stimulus, movement, excretion, and homeostasis. So unicellular organisms such as an amoeba are capable of all these uh, functions, but multicellular organisms have specialized cells to carry out some of the functions, but not others. But as a whole, all the functions are covered. So if you're looking at specific cells, within an, a multicellular organism, you may not be able to see that um, response to stimulus or that movement, but other cells will have that. There is, of course, some debate, like I just said, on the classification of viruses. They can't carry out all the functions independently. They must invade a host um, and use the host cell's apparatus to survive. So they are considered more acellular or not um, a cell. All right, so we need to practice with uh, microscopes. We will be doing a microscope skills lab uh, when you get into class, next class. So when um, you are using a microscope, we need to be able to determine the magnification of the image when we view it using a compound microscope. And you may remember this from our introductory bio class or baby bio. Um, you multiply the eyepiece times whichever objective lens that you're using. And um, I'll remind you all when we get to class how we um, identify the value of the magnification of the object objective lens. So if your eyepiece is 10 and you're using a 40 times objective lens, then the magnification of what you're looking at is 400 times. Um, I will also post this link to parts of the microscope. It's a really good review that you can also look at. But like I said, we will be doing that microscope skills lab as well. All right, so we have some standard international units of measurement that we need to remember. Um, and there are some blanks here, so I want to see if you can figure out what these would be. So I ask that you push pause here, try and figure them out. I'm going to go ahead on. So our missing values, we of course have our kilometer, which is 1,000 meters, so you would write that as 10 raised to the third power with the meter. A meter itself is just a regular M, and that is just one meter. There is no metric equivalent um, in scientific notation because it is a meter. But your centimeter, this is 100 times smaller than a meter, so you'd write 10 to the negative 2. A millimeter is 1,000 times. 10 to the negative 3. A micrometer is a thousand times smaller than a millimeter. Um, and that's when we get to a lot of our microscope images are going to be in this micrometer. You can see that the abbreviation is the mu, the little u with the little um, dash hanging down. And that is 10 to the negative 6 meters. And then a nanometer is the smallest that we would look at at class. And that is a thousand times smaller than a micrometer. So it is 10 to the negative Third. And we'll do some practice with conversions and um, microscopic um, calculations as well in class. All right, so here are the dreaded calculations in microscopy. So we use calculations to figure out the magnifications or the actual sizes. Sometimes we don't know what we're actually looking at. The important thing is that you convert all units to the same wherever it's appropriate or your math will be off. Go ahead and perform your calculations and then convert your answers to whatever is appropriate scientific um, notation when it's needed. So you have two different um, 
formulas. One for magnification, and with magnification, we're going to take the measured length divided by the scale bar label. So a lot of times in an image, you'll have this little bar here, and you'll have a number saying that, for example, this bar is two micrometers long. So then you'll take a ruler and you will measure the length of the bar. And when you measure the length of the bar, you get 30 millimeters or three centimeters. And you're gonna take that measurement, 30 millimeters, divide it by the two micrometers that's given. First thing you wanna do is get these into the same units. When we do that, we get 30,000 micrometers divided by two micrometers. When you divide two into 30,000, you get 15,000. The micrometer units cancel each other out. So your unit here when you're looking at magnification is just a times. So if you were looking at a picture of a specimen and you were trying to figure out how many times it had been magnified, given this information here, the image would have been magnified 15,000 times. So a little bit bigger than we would see in an actual classroom, in our classroom, be an image taken with an electron microscope. Sometimes we need to figure out the actual size of the organism, and this is something that we will do um, in a lab. You'll figure out the size of your organism. So what you do is you figure out the measured length times the magnification. So you take your ruler and you measure the organism. If it is um, on a paper, then you'll measure just from head to toe. If it's on the microscope, you can stick the ruler under the microscope as well. Um, and so here you get 450 millimeters, so it is four and a half centimeters long. Your magnification that we're going to divide it by is 15,000. So if we take 450 millimeters divided by 15,000 times, there's no units you need to get to the same. So when you divide that out, you get to 0 0.03 millimeters. And we want to go ahead and put that to micrometers so that we don't have any decimals. So you get 30 micrometers. All right, sometimes you have a scale bar and you want to find the actual size. So you need to figure out what we already know. So here you have the image length. This is a st an image uh, scanning electron microscope image of a stomata. So our image using a ruler is 50 millimeters or 5 centimeters. Our scale bar that's given here is 13 millimeters, and the bar represents 20 micrometers. So you could use either method. You could calculate the magnification first, then the actual size. So the magnification would be the measured length, which would be the 13,000 micrometers or 13 millimeters that we got up here, um, divided by the scale bar label, which is 20 micrometers. Okay, and you get a magnification of 650 times. And then to figure out the actual size, you take the measured length, which is 50 milliliter, millimeters, excuse me, and divide by the 650 um, times. The other thing you can do is you can actually factor the scale bar against the measured image. So this um, first method uses the two formulas that we just learned on the previous slide. So you could also take the image length divided by the scale bar image and then times the scale. So you take the image length, which is 50 millimeters, divided by how much you measured the image. So these are the two measurements that you have, the 50 and the 13, and then you multiply it times whatever number is given. Either way, um, it's whatever method makes you happy, but you should get the exact same answer, which is 76.9 micrometers, so pretty small. Kind of interesting in that all that's listed here, a molecule, a virus, a bacteria, an animal cell, a plant cell, they all fit within one plant cell. So if you're looking at a scale image, um, plant cell is much, much bigger than an animal cell, um, than a nucleus, than a membrane thickness, um, and all of that. So just kind of putting it into perspective, there is this magnification off cells alive. How big is a? Uh, and um, I'll post this link on uh, Blackboard so that you can check it out. It's kind of nice. It starts with a pen and then 
you zoom in and you can see um, kind of some different things and it'll highlight what you're looking at when you get to it. All right, so big cells versus small cells. So we need to, when we're looking at cells, we need to think about what's the difference between a big cell versus a small cell. Why are so many cells so small? So the first thing you want to look at is when you're looking at a small cell versus a big cell is how many units of membrane are there per unit volume. So we look at the volume over here with our small cell, we have one unit volume. But in our big cell, we have 27 units. With our surface area, we have six units. And in our surface area at a large, large cell, we have 54. So if you were to do a surface area to volume ratio, you have a 6 to 1 ratio with a small cell and a 2 to 1 ratio with a large cell. It's really important to remember that the plasma membrane, which would be the cube part itself, is responsible for the import-export in the cell, and metabolic reactions occur on these membranes. So if you have a larger surface-to-volume surface ratio, then the cell can act more efficiently. So a larger ratio would mean more distance between the two numbers. So a larger ratio means a smaller cell. Um, for every unit of volume that requires nutrients or waste that it produces, there's more membrane available to serve it to get those things in or out of the cell. We'll do um, a lab for with this uh, next week. So how else is a large surface area to volume ratio a benefit? So the first thing that we want to remember is the diffusion path. Look at the amount of distance from the nucleus here in this little cell to outside of the cell and then here in this much bigger cell to outside of the cell. So in a smaller cell, the diffusion pathway is shorter, so it's much more efficient. Those molecules don't have to travel as far to get into the cell or to get out of the cell, so it takes less time and um, would take less energy if active transport is required. Also, concentration gradients are easier to, di to generate, which makes diffusion more efficient. So it'll take less solute to make a 10% solution in a 100 milliliter beaker than it would in a 10 liter bucket. So um, when we get to diffusion, these two things might make a little bit more sense. But like I said in the previous slide, we will um, be doing a lab when we look at this as well. So, but the thing is, though, a large surface area to volume ratio, it's not always a good thing. There are some small, warm-blooded mammals and that lose heat very quickly because they have a large surface area to volume ratio. And because of this, they need to eat almost constantly. A great example of this is a shrew. Think about how hungry you get on a cold day and how much food you need to eat in order to get warm or feel full. The other thing is that des desert plants lose water quickly if they have flat leaves. So they've learned to minimize their surface area to volume ratio in order to conserve water. And there are some plants that actually can change their metabolism. They're called CAM plants um, or C-A-M and to save water. And you'll learn more about those when you get into the um, plant science chapter in HLB. All right, so how do organisms maximize the surface area to volume ratio? Well, as an organism grows, the cells divide. So two small cells are more efficient than one large cell. This is going to allow for cell differentiation and specialized functions when we get into multicellular organisms, such as us. Cells, there are a lot of cells that also compartmentalize. They use membranes to carry out meta metabolic processes, and in eukary eukaryotes, these things are called organelles. So these membranes that carry out specific processes are called organelles. Organelles themselves, like this mitochondria pictured here, are also made up of their own membranes. You can see all the little membranes here, these lines, and that maximizes additional surface area for reactions. You have some organs in organisms that have organ systems, such as our intestines, that fold up and are compact in order to maximize the surface area to volume ratio. This is very helpful to us because it makes the absorption of food molecules much, much more efficient. You also have things called alveoli in your lungs. These are thin membranes and that they help maximize the surface area for gas exchange.
plants have roots that are long and unbranched and off of the roots they also have little hairs on the cells and that also helps maximize the surface area for water uptake so there's a lot of things that organelles and organs and organisms can do to maximize their surface area to volume ratio get the most benefit that we can all right there are two big cell exceptions you have a giant bacterium with many genomes we'll get into this when we talk about our prokaryote prokaryotes topic but you also have some algae that are actually um, giant single celled cells with many um, nuclei and we'll talk about this we get into our uh, a lot more when we talk about our ecology and conservation unit it is an invasive species all right, so the last thing that we need to talk about in this particular section is called stem cells. Stem cells are specialized cells that retain, excuse me, stem cells are cells that have been able to retain the capacity to divide. And there are several different types of stem cells. You have something called a totipotent cell, and that cell can become any type of cell. This is a fertilized egg in the womb. That is the only type of totipotent cell. A pluripotent can become any type of cell except for the embryonic membrane. So a pluripotent cell will have developed from that totipotent, but at that point you have already had separation of the embryonic membrane and then the pluripotent cells. From pluripotent, you can have multipotent, and this can become any number of different cell types. So here you have pluripotent cells that can become neural cells, cardiac muscle cells, or blood cells. You do also have um, unipotent cells. These can only become one type of cell or nullipotent cells, which are cells that cannot divide into anything else. Um, a really good example of this is just red blood cells. The differentiation depends on the activation of the genes in the sequence, and it's often triggered by environmental change. Not environmental outside of the organism, but environmental um, as the cells are developing into the organism. Once a stem cell has differentiated, it can only make more stem cells or can only make that differentiated type of cell. It cannot go back and become... Um, the original type so for example once the totipotent cell has progressed from a fertilized egg to an eight celled embryo then these cells are only pluripotent we now have no longer have totipotent cells um, as previously just stated the cell differentiation is a result of the expression of different genes it's interesting to note that all cells in the very in the body carry 100% of the same genes in their nucleus, but what makes one cell different from another is which genes are expressed or which are turned on or off. And this is triggered by changes and the environment around the cell. So here you have embryonic stem cells that can become either part of the mesoderm, such as your cardiac muscle, uh, skeletal muscle cells, tubules within the kidney, red blood cells, or smooth muscle cells, or those embryonic cells can become part of the endoderm, um, which are lung cells or thyroid cells or pancreatic cells. And then the last type of cell that, or cell line that can be developed from these embryonic stem cells are the ectoderm. These would be your skin cells, your neural cells, and pigment cells. Here is a little activity that we will um, hopefully get to in a few days when we start working on, st on stem cells in class. All right, so you can have stem cell transplants. So stem cells are not all bad things. In this particular example, um, we're going to talk about stem cells used to treat lymphoma. So in the treatment of lymphoma, lymphoma is a bone marrow disease. So when you have bone marrow that is destroyed by chemotherapy or radiotherapy, radiation, before this treatment takes place, they take stem cells that are harvested from the bone marrow and they store them. Then we would give the patient chemotherapy or radiation therapy or perhaps both, both if um, they have lymphoma. And these cells, um, the bone marrow is destroyed during these process. So if you have lymphoma, lymphoma is um, a cancer of the lymphatic system. 
Stop. So lymphoma is a cancer of the lymphatic system. When you have your treatment for lymphoma, your bone marrow is destroyed. So you harvest the bone marrow before the treatment, and then after the treatment, and after you've recovered from the treatment, we can then use these harvested cells to replace the damaged bone marrow within um, the person they were harvested from. So this is helpful because it produces healthy blood cells in the recovering patient. Another use of stem cells is called therapeutic cloning, and this is part of stem cell research that's a little bit more controversial. So therapeutic cloning involves the in vitro culturing of tissues using patient or donor stem cells. So we're growing tissues from stem cells. We, um, it can be used to replace tissues that have been lost to disease or tissues that have been burned, like skin cells. Um, or even nerve cells that have been damaged. Because these embryonic stem cells are the most versatile, they have been at the center of the research and the controversy. Um, and we will be doing um, some case study work with this. But in the meantime, let's watch this YouTube video. The transplant breakthrough. A young mother in Spain has been given a trachea transplant, which was grown using her own stem cells. Thomas Moore of Britain's Sky News reports. Just a few weeks after her pioneering operation and Claudia Castillo is able to breathe normally once more. The new airway that surgeons transplanted into her lungs is working well and because it was built in a lab using her own stem cells, it won't be rejected by her body. Tuberculosis had caused the airway to Claudia's left lung to collapse, so in a world first, doctors used tissue engineering to make her a new one. They removed the breathing tube from a dead woman and used chemicals to strip away the cells that would normally cause rejection after transplantation. They then used stem cells from Claudia's hip, lungs and nose to create cartilage and other specialised cells. These were then used to coat the breathing tube. Surgeons then cut the airway to size and in June they implanted it into Claudia. Scientists predict that this is the start of a new era of body organs that had grown to order using patients' own stem cells and then transplanted without risk of rejection. Eventually, 3,000 a year could benefit across Europe, giving back quality of life to people like Claudia. Thomas Moore, Sky News. All right. Okay, so as you can see, um, there are different ways that we can harvest stem cells. So um, embryonic stem cell culture themselves, you would need a newly fertilized cell. You take that inner mass from the blastocyst and then you culture that in a petri dish and we get undifferentiated embryonic stem cells. So this is embryonic stem cells, which are um, very controversial. IPS stem cells are coming, um, are becoming more popular and they may reduce the need for embryonic stem cells. IPS stands for induced pluripotent. This is getting differentiated cells um, and reprogramming them to return to a stem cell like state. So here in this case, we have a mouse with sickle cell anemia. Um, we're going to collect his skin cells, and then we're going to reprogram them. We get genetically identical IPS, or induced pluripotent cells. We're going to correct the mutation, and then um, grow those corrected mutation cells. We now have differentiated cells grown into blood stem cells, and then we'll transplant it in. And now our mouse does not have sickle cell anemia. He is a recovered mouse. So kind of complicated, um, but there's a lot of things going on. Um, and as you can see from the video with Claudia, stem cell research does not always involve embryonic stem cells as shown here. All right, so that is the end of today's notes. Um, I did find this funny little uh, cartoon where a young gentleman um, is talking to his advisor. Do I have to declare a major? Can't I just be a stem cell? <laughs>
Anyway, I hope you enjoy these notes and I look forward to discussing them with you in class.